Today on Detroit Muscle, we'll keep you in suspense as our giveaway Trans Am gets new legs and 600 pound feet of torque wedged in around and under it. It's major upgrades galore as this TA goes from tired to wired. Detroit Muscle starts now. Our first project means that we're going to be kicking it bandit style with this 1978 Pontiac Trans Am. We bought it from a lady who's had it since the mid 80s, then slapped it on the chassis dyno with some help from our sister show, Engine Power. All that we could squeeze out of it was a monstrous 152 horsepower. Well, that's not going to work. So then we got the Pontiac Power Gurus from Butler Performance to help us build up a Pontiac 455 into a 550 horsepower stroker that'll roast the tires plumb off this bird. The grand idea here is to pay tribute to the iconic black and gold special edition Trans Ams that we all remember, and then give ours away to one of you guys. Of course, a lot of the inspiration comes from that Burt Reynolds classic, Smokey and the Bandit. Hopefully, we won't have any county mounties chasing us when this thing's done. Well, right now, we're kind of an impasse. We got that big, bad stroker motor ready to drop into its new home. However, that 150 horse dog is still sitting in its place. The plan is to snatch this old motor out so we can spruce up a bit, clean paint all under here before we drop in that new engine. In case you're wondering, no, this isn't the original engine from this car. It came from an earlier model TA. So keeping the numbers matching engine, well, that's a no-go since it's already gone. So first things first, we got to get this hood off. There are a few things in life more titillating than trying to contort your body around a hood while doing major engine surgery. So I think we'll go ahead and lose ours for this swap. Little bird's heavy. Don't forget to drain the radiator into a pan before you pull the lower hose. That way you can save yourself a pretty big mess. What he just said about avoiding a mess? There we go. Well, so much for that. We know that the old exhaust is going away for good. So no need to struggle when the reciprocating saw makes short work of removing it. Okay, let's see if I get this old dry shaft going. There. You know, we're using a lift to get all this stuff out from underneath, but if you're doing this at home, don't forget without the drive shaft, the thing's gonna want to roll. Get ready for the roll. The motor mount bolts can come out next, as well as the transmission crossmember bolts. We're removing the old trans in conjunction with the engine, so stuff like that and the speedo cable will need to be disconnected. Of course, you can't forget the training linkage. Let it down. If you're tackling an engine swap for the first time, safety should be your first concern. Use a cherry picker rated to handle the weight. This transmission decided to dump fluid all over the floor for us. So try as we might to catch it, we got another mess to clean up. Well, after some additional exhaust trimming for clearance, well, she's pretty well ready to come out. It used to be too much, let me know. I'll give you a break, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> what you huffing and a puffing for? I'm gonna blow your house down. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Joe. Funny thing about an old greasy engine is that it leaves a greasy old mess that's got to be taken care of. That's her. All right, we got scrapers. What's this thing for? Are you gonna siphon some gas out? <laughs> well, it does kind of work as a Tennessee credit card too, <laughs> but I'm gonna use this little piece of hose as a device, well, to keep water out of the gearbox. Yeah, that's pretty smart. Well, I'm gonna scrape some of the gunk off this engine cradle before we give this thing a bath, or before you do. We're simply gonna push this hose onto the return and then take it and loop it back around to the factory power steering hose. That keeps any water, moisture, or solvent, or cleaner out of that gearbox, keeps from messing it up. It's a dirty job, but like they say, somebody's gotta do it. Some of this gunk has likely been here for better than 30 years. Is it time for lunch? I think it's time for moving this thing outside. All right. 
Guess we can do that before we go to lunch. Yes. Well, we're ready to spray on some cleaner. We got some degreaser from Safety Clean. We're gonna hose this stuff on, let it set, go grab a bite to eat, come back and see what we got. If you've got access to a power washer, it'll save you a boatload of time over a brush and bucket. And you can rent them pretty cheaply too. Well, we got everything taped up, cleaned up, ready to start doing some spraying. We're gonna put on some Duplicolor spray enamel to give our engine bay a makeover. Now this is engine enamel, and even though we're not really spraying the engine, this stuff is designed to withstand the temperatures and chemical elements that live under the hood of your car. Stick around and get the skinny on the mystical, magical inner workings of torque converters. Then we'll show you a snappy way to address potential cross-member incompatibilities, as well as a complete front suspension overhaul. It looks like you got this old Pontiac wrapped and ready for a little personality, huh? Oh yeah, we're gonna spray on a good bit of it. What are you gonna do first? Well, I'm gonna spray on some of this primer to give myself a good even canvas to start with. Mm -hmm. And then I might even let you start painting some. Uh, Pontiac blue, I hope. Oh yeah, not none of that Ford stuff that you like. <laughs> <laughs> The primer that we're using is Duplicolor's Engine Enamel Primer. The reason that you want to try to have a uniform canvas for your paint is that the colors of the components themselves can affect the color of the paint that goes over top of it. And spraying all of them the same shade of primer not only preps the surface, but it makes everything the same hue, ensuring that your top coat will have a consistent look. Duplicolor also offers that iconic Pontiac blue in their engine enamel lineup. And once the masking is removed, well, you can see it looks pretty darn good on our stroker. Well, here's what we're mating up to that beautiful blue engine. It's a 700R4 Street Fighter from TCI, tough enough to handle 750 horsepower. It's an automatic with overdrive for comfortable cruising on the interstate. Now the TCI torque converter is built for more low and mid-range power and it has a 2400 RPM stall to complement that cam in our 474. You know, torque converters are often a mysterious and confusing part in the drivetrain and if that's the case for you, watch this, it might help. Torque converters are built with one thing in mind transferring power from your engine to an automatic transmission. It does this by turning an impeller with a series of vanes attached to it. When the engine reaches the converter's stall speed, the fluid inside the unit is forced toward the outside of the housing by centrifugal force. The fluid will then begin to spin a turbine which is splined into the transmission's input shaft. The stall of the converter simply refers to the RPMs required to begin forcing movement of the turbine. Higher stall converters are typically employed in more performance-oriented applications, whereas stock-style setups will often employ lower stall units. Now, since the R4 is basically a Chevy transmission, we need this adapter plate to make it work with our 474. It's all part of a kit that includes a linkage bracket, TV cable, trans cooler, hardware, and even all the training fluid you'll need. Easy does it. Slow down, stop. <clears throat> okay, come up, just a smidge. Up. With our adapter plate bolted onto the back of the engine and the flex plate in place. Up a little bit. There it is, perfect. The power plant and transmission can be joined in holy matrimony. Then we'll work on plugging the newlyweds into their appropriate home in our Trans Am. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Easy does it. We don't want to scratch up our nicely painted engine or car. It doesn't take long before we start to realize that, well, the factory cross member is hanging us up. We try as we might. It's not gonna allow us to properly position the transmission. That 
that's no big deal. A few bolts and some hammer taps, and the old cross member is out of the way. Then, the engine can seat onto its mounts. Tell you what, man, that's a pretty little motor sitting in there. Yeah, I think it looks just fine. It looks right at home. Keep your eyes peeled and we'll go through the disassembly and reassembly of our front suspension system, including a coilover upgrade that improves your handling, along with the brake swap we're doing on this old bird. Well, we just about got our transmission bolted up. We run into a little snag. Our stock cross member wouldn't bolt into place running this 700 R4, but that's no biggie because we got this X Factor cross member from American Powertrain. The X Factor is an all aluminum, highly modular piece that allows you to run a huge combination of drivetrain components while being both strong and lightweight. Now, the factory rubber mount was never really designed to withstand the power that we're going to have in our Trans Am. So, we got this pretty little jewel here that we got from Prothane. And I tell you, it's going to handle all the abuse that we could ever throw at it. Well, naturally, we want that thing to uh, drive as good as it runs. So, here's an upgrade for the front suspension, all from Classic Performance Products, beginning with a stiffer inch and a quarter sway bar, some of their tubular upper and lower control arms, and a set of single adjustable coilover shocks. These things, by the way, will lower the ride height about an inch to two inches. So let the suspension tear down begin. The stock calipers are first to go, and we're gonna replace the rubber brake lines anyway, so those can just be clipped. Then the tie rods can be uh, persuaded out of the way. The sway bar links are going bye-bye as well, so instead of struggling to loosen them up, it's the old hot wrench. Then the sway bar drops out. The top shock mount is unbolted first, then the two bottom bolts can be loosened, allowing you to remove the shock. The spindle is held on with a couple of pin castle nuts. Now be careful, this thing contains the energy of that front spring. Using a jack to hold the bottom control arm up while you remove the nut is a good way to keep that spring in check. Then you can let the jack down and remove the spring. But like I said, use caution. With that out of the way, the spindle can come off. A couple of bolts hold the upper control arm on, as well as a couple more, which hold on the lower one. You've seen us install tubular control arms many times before, and well, if you wondered why, it's simple. It offsets the stock suspension geometry and provides for better performance handling and helps you carve those corners a lot easier. Somehow, Joe managed to get the less greasy job of installing the shiny new parts. When it comes to how hard you want to run these bolts down, you want to make sure they're pretty darn tight. Now we're ready for our coilovers, and here's a little tip for you. If you put a little Loctite anti-seize on this adjuster, it won't gall up when you're ready to use it. See if this thing will go up. To get these coilover shocks on, we'll have to cheat a bit using a nut and washer to hold the top in place. Here, let me help you, Joe. Then we'll get the two bottom bolts secured to the lower control arm. Here we go. And using a screw jack, we can load up the suspension, allowing us to remove the temporary nut and washer on top, then insert the proper rubber grommet and washer. Now, how much do you tighten down the shock nut? Well, you want to squish down this rubber grommet until it's flush with this washer and no more. That's about enough. Now for the jam nut. Well, thanks to Tommy and the bead blaster and some paint, the spindle looks brand new. We also use our old screw jack trick to bring the spindle up where it can be bolted to the upper control arm. But if your car is on the ground, a floor jack does the job just as well. When you upgrade your suspension like this, it only makes sense to remove the old original steering components and install some new ones like these we got from rockauto.com. Otherwise, it's 
kind of like trying to play basketball in worn out cowboy boots. And once the car hits the road, you gotta come back and tighten everything up again because it will settle in during the first run. Why is it important to take one crucial step before you use a set of brand new brakes? We'll show you in just a few. Detroit Muscle will be right back. Hey, we're back after upgrading the front suspension on this old red bird. And well, since we also added some extra horsepower, we need some better binders to bring it to a halt. We'll start with a set of EBC Sport Rotors. Now, these things have slots to keep the pads cooler and help them wear evenly. These dimples, well, they're all about degassing the rotors. Some Safety Clean Brake Cleaner will help us clean our new rotors, ensuring that there aren't any unwanted substances that could compromise our brakes. We're also using EBC's Yellow Stuff pads, which are ideal for serious street and track use. They're made with a high friction formula. Add the red break-in services, well, and make sure we get safe instant braking as soon as we install them. These EBC pads work with our factory calipers, which we've cleaned up and painted with cast iron colored paint. Now some of these cars did come with four wheel discs, but ours came with drums in the rear. However, we got a little trick for that, and oh, you have to wait and see. Hey Joe, you got that old line off? Yeah, check it out. More cracks than you'd find at a plumber's convention. <laughs> Well, you guys, you want to replace the rubber brake lines on these things because they're considered a consumable part. You got to think of them as like a set of tires. They just wear out, crack, and you don't want to replace one of them because if one's bad, they're all bad. And that's why Tommy is going to replace all of them with these we got from rockauto.com. Sounds like I got the short end of the stick of that one. I don't know. Good day today, and uh, I guess next time we'll jump on the rear of this car, brakes and such, and oh, show you that little trick we talked about. That's it. Get yeah. out of the way. All Get right. out of the way. Jeez. You know, there's nothing like variety, even in your car's exhaust note. This electric exhaust cutout kit from Doug's allows you to convert to wide open exhaust with the flick of a switch. In addition to the pipes, you get a pair of heavy duty stainless steel drive mechanisms that stay sealed so they're leak proof, open or shut. Also, you get the wiring harness, toggle switch and fuses. They're sewed separately or as a kit with prices that vary according to application. For your next carburetor swap, you can get great throttle response and street performance in this bolt and go package. It's a 750 CFM carb with vacuum secondaries from Summit Racing. It's got an all aluminum leak free design and each one is flow tested to run straight out of the box. It's got a tumble polished body and black anodized trim for some good looks and a good price too, 286 bucks. Say, so if you're dressing up the interior of your first gen Camaro, of course you want some nice door panels. The standard series from TMI fits coupes, convertibles, and probably your budget. They're made with original factory materials and come in a variety of original colors. Plus, they're guaranteed for quality, fit, and finish. You can finish off your Camaro's doors for about 95 bucks. Well, we just finished off another Detroit Muscle. See you next time. I like that new sound. <laughs> <laughs>